For some of you, you're like, man, get 2018 in the rearview mirror as quickly as possible. It was a bust. For some of you, it's 2018 was great. What's 2019 going to be? For some of you, it's like, eh, it's another day. Whatever it is, don't get stuck in the past. Look to Jesus. A lot of people are defined by their past. One of the things that we have to help people with in counseling a lot is there's nothing about your past you can change. Whether it was abuse, whether it was neglect, you had a hard life, you had an easy life. You were blessed financially, you weren't blessed financially. It doesn't matter. The past is in the past. Now, what about those good things? Don't let the good things define you. Let Christ define you. We're going to take our lesson out of Philippians chapter 3, but I want you to turn with me first to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Some of you are new, new to the faith, new Christians, wondering what God can do with your life. Maybe you messed it up pretty good. Maybe you didn't. Maybe you don't realize how bad you are. Maybe you will. 1 Corinthians 6, beginning at verse 9. I love this wonderful portion of Scripture where Paul helps us understand our past doesn't define us. 1 Corinthians 6, beginning at verse 9, just follow along. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit, will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Your past is used by God, but your past doesn't define you. What about on the positive side? What if you, you got that raise that you finally deserve, or that promotion, or you got married, or you got unmarried, and things were good? What about all those things, the degrees you earn, the titles you were given? Well, let's see Paul's outlook on this. If you'll stand with me, Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 16. Philippians 3, 1 through 16. Paul says, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the, tri of the people of, Benja of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. 
that I may know him and the power of his resurrection may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting which, which, what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal the, that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. You can be seated. While the sermon is going to focus on uh, living in regret, the opposite is also true. Uh, living in a satisfaction of, I've kind of arrived in life. I, I, I got everything I want. I, I have kids that don't mouth back. I have a job that pays well, and they, they ask me how much I want to make. I, I, have, I have the perfect marriage, the perfect house, never re needs to be repaired, remodeled, or the grass mowed. <laughs> Everything is great. Don't take pride in all that you have attained. Learn to trust the Lord. We're going to focus on regret, but think about this. Living in regret of the losses of the past is not the attitude of the true believer. Living in regret of the losses of the past is not the attitude of the true believer. We, we read this list. We're going to read part of it again. But Paul didn't consider any earthly accomplishments worthy of clinging to. No earthly accomplishments, that promotion, that, that place of honor, that, that um, uh, degree, none of it was worth clinging to. Notice how he, he talked about them, verses 3 through 6. We'll read that again. Verses 3 through 6 of Philippians 3. For we are the circumcision. Talking about we Christians. We are the circumcision who worship the, by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. What he's saying there is we as Christians, we have our hearts circumcised by the Spirit of God. Our sins have been separated from us as far as the east is from the west. God chooses to remember them no more. We're no longer under judgment. But those who put confidence in the flesh are still under judgment. Verse 4, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. He's, he's like, okay, I'm, I'm taking no confidence in the flesh, putting no confidence in the flesh, but I want you to know if you think you match up, you don't. Check out my resume. Again, verse 4, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day. I mean, the law says, God's law, Old Testament said, circumcise the males on the eighth day. His parents did that. He didn't have a choice. He was, by virtue of his parents, obedient to Christ. Of the people of Israel, again, going back to Jewish people, the Jews thought they were better than everybody else, hands down, no comparison. We are the people of God, you're not. Of the tribe of Benjamin, smallest tribe, yet out of it comes Paul, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He is on the who's who of Judaism. He's ranked most likely to succeed. As to the law, a Pharisee. This is like Yale, 
Harvard, Princeton, Ivy League stuff. And he's at the top of his class. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. Look at my life. Check my internet records. Check my history. Check out my work habits. Check out the people I hang out with. Check out the words I use. Check out my Bible reading log on internet. And you will find I haven't missed a day. There's no flaw. You can do the, the search with a fine tooth comb and there's nothing against me. Blameless. And in spite of all those credentials, how smart he was. And, and we can say hands down, nobody here is smart as him. Nobody in this room is as smart as Paul. If you think you are, you have a pride problem. He was genius. He was a lawyer. Whatever you think about lawyers. He was a lawyer. He was hands down brilliant. How do you know? Have you read the New Testament? Have you read Romans? Have you read Ephesians chapter 1, 2, 3? 4, 5, and 6 is good too. Have you checked that out? He's He's brilliant. But he says, I, I put no confidence in the flesh. The word confidence here means to believe something or someone to the extent of placing reliance or trust in or on. And what he's saying is, I accomplished all this stuff, but I am not putting my, my security, I'm not putting my confidence in everything that I've attained, in my, in my brilliance, in my degree, in my pedigree, nothing. I am not, that's not where my confidence comes from. Just because I'm smart and just because I can make an argument that would make most of our heads spin does not mean that I got that on my own. John Calvin, in commenting on this, says, ignorance of Christ is the sole reason why people are puffed up with vain confidence. You think you're all that? You haven't compared yourself to Jesus yet. Paul, this brilliant guy, could say he could put no confidence in the flesh because he didn't compare himself with himself, evaluate himself by himself. He evaluated himself in comparison to Jesus Christ. And in comparison to Christ, he's nothing. Again, John Calvin. Ignorance of Christ is the sole reason why people are puffed up with a vain confidence. Hence, where we see a false estimation of one's own excellence, where we see arrogance, where we see pride, there let us be assured that Christ is not known. Okay, Happy New Year. We have to always do battle with pride. It is the mother of all sins. The moment that we think, I'm better than you, that's an anti-Christ attitude. Paul looked at his pedigree, he looked at all that stuff in the past, and he, he willingly gave up these earthly achievements for the sake of Christ. He willingly gave up earthly achievements for the sake of Christ. He didn't look at the past and, and uh, say, oh, you know, I came to Jesus, but man, I had so much going for me before I came to Jesus. I had fame. I had pedigree. I had a people's, a people's attention. I was on the who who's list. And man, I kind of missed that. There was none of that for him. He said in verse 7, but whatever gain I had, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Here's what he's saying. All that stuff I put my confidence in was a total waste of time and energy. It was a total loss. And I'm glad to get rid of it. 
I'm, I don't care about the degree. I don't care about the title. I don't care about being on who's who's list. All I care about is Jesus. Verse 7 again, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. So we could say knowing Christ sets priorities right. You'll always be lopsided without Jesus. You'll think you're going down the road just fine. But you're going down the road on flat tires. Because you don't have the Spirit of God, the pneuma, we get our word pneumatic, we don't have the Spirit of God inflating us in a right way, indwelling us. We're flat without Jesus. Knowing Christ, that's priorities right. In verse 8, indeed, I count everything a law as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. You look at all these things. This is, I want to do this, and I want to do this, and I've accomplished this, and oh, this was great. Or some of you look at the past and go, but man, my life was so messed up in the past. This happened to me. These people did this to me. I could have done this. I lost this. So what? Who are you with Jesus? Where's Christ in your life? All these great things that Paul gave up, that God took from him, were worth it. Again, let me read verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Now, that doesn't mean we don't pursue degrees. It doesn't mean we don't try to increase our knowledge about life. It doesn't mean that we don't try to have good relationships or that we dishonor all people in our lives. What it means is everything falls under knowing Christ. Every relationship will be made right or better when we know Christ because we have a foundation at that point upon which to build. Compared to knowing Christ, all earthly achievements are worthless. So, so you think about New Year's resolution. I, I want to lose weight. I mean, that's a number one resolution people make, and it lasts about two weeks. We always have to start after New Year's dinner. Right? And you won't be able to keep it because Valentine's Day is coming up in February. <laughs> and what do most people do on Valentine's Day? Go out to eat. And what do you get your woman on Valentine's Day? Chocolate, the very thing she hates and loves at the same time. You, you just, we're food oriented. So forget the idea that you're going to make this New Year's resolution to lose weight. Be a good steward of your body. He's given us all things richly to enjoy, but not to worship. Enjoy the food, don't worship it. Enjoy life, but don't worship it. Worship God. Compared to knowing Christ, all earthly achievements are worthless. What are you really committed to? Are you committed to growing in Christ? Paul says, continuing on in verse 8, he says, for his sake, that be Christ's sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and Count them as rubbish. He's not saying, you know, uh, I, 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 I really willing, willingly gave those up. He says, I put a lot of effort into these former things in my life. And it was a total waste. It was a total waste. Um, you think about some of the dumb degrees in universities today. Um, the vast majority of young people who graduate from college do not find careers in the area of their degree. The vast majority. That's 60 to 80 to more, $100,000 that you got a piece of paper for 
that you can't even use today. Makes it feel like rubbish, doesn't it? Or you get down your life and you go, man, I'm working in this field of my career, the choice. I hate it. There's a lot of that going around too. I, 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 this, is the, this is my career choice. I went to school for it. I despise it. But it's too late. What else can I do? The word rubbish means worthless or unwanted material that is rejected and normally thrown out. Rubbish, litter, trash, we can put in there, garbage. It's garbage. John Calvin again said this, Paul declares that he had not merely abandoned everything that he formerly reckoned precious, but that they were like dung. Should not be ding. I was a... <laughs> misspell on my part you can say ding if you want it's dung <laughs> offensive to him this is where i like the logos just copy paste i don't have this on logos so it turned out ding um, <laughs> they were offensive to him and were dis and were disesteemed like things that are thrown away in contempt in contempt it's worthless it's not even worth going back and visiting only when earthly accomplishments take their proper place will we begin to live by faith in Christ and his righteousness. Only when earthly accomplishments take their proper place will we, be, will we begin to live by faith in Christ and his righteousness. Not every young man is called to be a pastor, a missionary, uh, a, a, a Christian school teacher, or any other thing like that. We need Men who can work and do hands-on labor stuff. Uh, we need men and women who are smart and who know how to apply themselves to tasks. But understand, all those accomplishments must fall under, first of all, knowing Christ. That's what is most important. Verses 8 and 9 in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Too many people are disappointed because life didn't turn out the way they wanted. They didn't get the life that they desired. They didn't get the parents that they believe would have made them a better person. They didn't get the friends who wouldn't forsake them. They, they, life just didn't turn out their way and now they're bitter for it. And what needs to happen is there needs to be a view, a different view that even in those very, very, very hard times of life, God was working them out for good. They're painful. They're hard. Um, some of the things that happen to people are evil. But God hasn't lost control. He's using them in your life to draw you to himself and to draw you into a deeper relationship where the material things are not as important as that which is spiritual, that which flows from him. So we, like Paul, must desire to grow in our knowledge of Christ. We have to desire to grow in a knowledge of Christ. And Paul is going to spell out here how we actually do this. So if you're, if you're looking for what can I study in 2019 that will help me to grow spiritually, just follow Paul's recommendation. First of all, we must grow in our overall knowledge of Christ. Who is Jesus? Verse 10, Paul said that I may know him. We, we need this overall arching theology. The, the knowledge of God, knowledge of Christ, theology proper is the study of God. 
So, so grab yourself some books on theology proper. Make sure that they're, they're good, solid teaching. If you don't know, see one of the pastors here. We can give you direction. But do a study on God, theology proper, and then, and then in particular, Christology, the study of Jesus Christ. Who is he? Grow in your overall knowledge of Christ. That's what Paul, this brilliant man, wanted to do. We must grow in our knowledge of Christ's power as evidenced in his resurrection. Study the resurrection. Read it. Talk about or read about how many times Paul talks about resurrection. <coughs> grow in your understanding and knowledge of the resurrection. Um, without the resurrection, we have no eternal life. But how did Jesus rise from the dead? What did his death look like? How dead was he? I ask that seriously. How dead was he? Because if, like some people say, he was just uh, comatose and woke up, then how did he move the stone? Beaten as he was tortured as he was, if he was really dead, and he was, how did he come back to life? Under whose power? Well, he said he had the power to lay, raise, to lay his life down, and he had the power to raise it again. Study the resurrection. Paul said he wanted to know the power of his resurrection. We must grow in our willingness to share in Christ's sufferings. Study about suffering. To rightly deal with suffering. One of the things that keeps our counseling ministry growing is people who suffer and don't handle it biblically. Suffering is part of the human existence. Christ suffered. We all suffer. We suffer loss, we suffer poor health, we suffer the, the decisions of other people, we suffer. How did Christ suffer? We have to grow in our understanding and willingness to take up our cross daily. Study about what it means to take up the cross daily. Paul said, becoming like him in his death. Jesus said in Luke 9, 23, he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. What does sacrificial living actually look like? What does it mean to deny yourself? What does it mean to take up the cross daily? What does it mean to no longer live for your, yourself or to no longer live for the flesh, to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit? What does that mean? Study that. Grow in that. Growing in our knowledge of Christ means living worthy of our calling, confident that eternity is greater than any sacrifice we will make now. Grow in your understanding and knowledge of Christ's resurrection and ascension into heaven. He's going and has gone to prepare a place for us. What does that mean? Paul said in verse 11 <clears throat> that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Now let me, let me tell you what he's not saying before I tell you what he is saying. He's not saying, well, I, I sure hope I found the right way, but whatever that way is, I want to find it so that I get the resurrection. He's not saying that. He's confident that there's only one name given among men whereby we must be saved, and it's the name of Jesus. What he is really saying is, it doesn't matter how I die, 
how I attain this resurrection, what method God uses to take me to himself, in, in, in any way, it's okay. By any means, we could say this, by any means of death, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. However I die, I'm going to be with the Lord. The New International Greek Testament commentary makes this statement on this verse about Paul. He might reach the resurrection through martyrdom or by some other kind of death, or he might be alive at the coming of Christ. The resurrection is certain. The intervening events are uncertain. Jesus may return. That's got my vote. I might die, not that high on my priority list. But we're all headed there. And our confidence needs to be not in, you know, God, when I stand before you, I can tell you I had this PhD. So what? Are you as smart as Jesus? You know, God, I accomplished all these things and I had a big bankroll. So what? Do you own as much as God? Is he impressed with your smarts? Who gave you your brain? And will you fight him with the very brain that he gave you? Who gave you your breath so that you can talk and talk smart? Are you going to use the breath that he gave you to fight against him? Who gave you the health so that you can work? Are you going to use the health that God gave you to fight against him? Paul said, it's all, all this earthly stuff, it's momentary, it's fleeting, it's passing, it's all a loss for the sake of knowing Christ. It's a distant second. So based upon Paul's example of knowing Christ, we must never become complacent in our Christian life. When you look back on 2018 or you look back further in your life, some of you are carrying a boatload of bitterness. You can recall the things that happened to you decades ago and recall them like they were yesterday. How's that happen? We're going to get to that. So, while, while though faith in Christ, while through faith in Christ we are saved and preserved, we haven't arrived yet. We're always growing. We're always growing in our knowledge of Christ. We're always growing in a deeper understanding of him. We're always growing in our sanctification, meaning we're putting off the old man, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. We're being made new in the attitude of our mind, and we're putting on the new man created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That's progressive sanctification, to put off, to renew the mind, to put on principle of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 4 and 5 talks about that a lot. Paul's very intentional. That's part of progressive sanctification. Although we have faith in Christ and are saved, we're preserved, we haven't arrived. So as Christians, stop thinking you've arrived. Stop thinking your life is good enough. Knowing Jesus is enough, and I, I, now I'm ready for heaven. I can do what I please. No. Do what he pleases. Do what pleases God. Verse 12. Paul said, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect. Christians ought to be the number one people who acknowledge they're wrong. We ought to be the number one people who say, I'm a mess. But for the grace of God, I'd be even more of a mess. So I'm not the mess I used to be, but I'm not yet what God wants me to be. But thank God that there's progress. John Calvin said this way. Talking about Paul, he teaches by his own example that we ought to make progress. 
and that the knowledge of Christ is an attainment of such difficulty that even those who apply themselves exclusively to it do nevertheless not attain perfection in it so long as they live. Progressive sanctification, Christ-like holiness, it's, it's our goal. It's an unreachable goal that will only be reached through death. But we ought to pro progress in it. We ought to make progress in our life knowing that I'm intentional. So in 2019, when you're thinking about what can I do in 2019 that will please the Lord, study more. Study more. Don't study what you think you know as if you already know it. Study that which is going to stretch you. Study that which challenges, not, not in an unbiblical way or a liberal way or an anti-biblical uh, way, but study that which takes you out of your comfort zone doctrinally. I'm not saying we should study tongues and we should study. No, no, no. Study that which you haven't really studied. Study the solas of the Reformation. Study the doctrines of grace. Study the life of, a, of someone in Scripture, the life of Moses, the life of Adam. How is Adam referred to in Scripture? Why is he called the second Adam? And why is Christ called the first Adam? Uh, why Christ called the first Adam, the second Adam, and, and Adam called the first Adam, and what is their relationship to humanity? Study. We haven't arrived. As followers of Christ, we must be intentional in our perseverance to the end because of all that Christ did for us. We don't persevere to the end simply because the Bible says that those who persevere to the end will be saved. Perseverance doesn't save us. Christ saves us, and Christians persevere. Grow in perseverance, not because you want security for your salvation, but because you are secure in Christ. Persevere to the end. The Apostle Paul knew who he was in Christ and persevered. Verse 12, again, he says, But I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus made me his own. I press on. I press on. Don't coast through your Christian life, press on. Paul, uh, uh, John Calvin again said, Paul was apprehended by Christ that he might apprehend Christ. Christ redeems us so that we might know him more and be more like him. So spiritual growth has two main principles to it. Two main principles. How do you deal with all the bitterness of the past? These two principles will help you. Stop rehearsing the past. Stop rehearsing the past. Satan keeps a record of wrongs. Christians don't. Why don't Christians? Because God doesn't. When we are in Christ, he separates our sins from us as far as the east is from the west. He chooses not to remember them again. And in the final judgment, we are declared righteous finally in Christ for eternity. We're declared righteous in Christ now, even though we aren't practically righteous but then we will be declared righteous and we will be fully righteous. Stop rehearsing the past. Verse 13, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting which lies, what lies behind. 
The more you rehearse the past, the more the past defines the present. If you want to really grow in Christ, acknowledge, yeah, there's a past. These things happen. But God was sovereign even in the events that happened in my life. But they're in the past. I want to know Christ. I don't want those things to define me. I want Christ to define me. Satan is the accuser of the brothers. And he accuses them night and day before the throne of God. Now, thank God he's been defeated by Satan. He no longer does that, but he accuses us in our own brains. And he helps us to remember the past. And the more you rehearse the past, the more of a life of its own it gets. So what do I do when it comes? Thank God you're not in the past and that he used the past to bring you to the present and you want to glorify God from here forward. What about those people who did whatever they did? What about them? Do you want them to still do that? Because every time you rehearse it, they do. Stop rehearsing. Commit it to the Lord and leave it. The word forgetting means to not recall information concerning some particular matter to forget to not recall. Some people have pushed recall so much, it just becomes automatic now. Boom, boom, boom. Just, here it is. Well, what happens when it gets recalled? You have to be as intentional in not recalling it, not dwelling on it, not rehearsing it, not going there. Forget it. It's in the past. Don't let your past define you. Let Christ define you. So the one part is leave the past in the past. The second part is apply great effort to move forward spiritually. Apply great effort to move forward spiritually. Stop hitting recall. Start looking forward. Verse 13, Paul said, in straining forward to what lies ahead. Straining forward to what lies ahead does not mean 2019 is going to be a better year. Physically, emotionally, it could be worse. But we don't put our hope in the things that are tangible. Our hope is in Christ. We strain forward for what lies ahead. And what lies ahead is not 2019. What lies ahead is eternity with Christ in heaven. We strain toward that. Straining forward means to reach out or stretch out towards some goal. Our goal can't be, I just want to survive 2018. I got just a couple days left. I think I can do it. No, that's not good. You may not make it through 2018. You may. But that's not the goal. The goal is whether you live or whether you die, you are the Lord's. You belong to Christ. Live in Him. Stop pushing recall. Start, stop telling everybody their fault. Stop rehearsing all the things of the past. What is in the past stays in the past. Move forward. Move forward by intentionally thinking about Christ and glorifying Him. Straining toward what is ahead. As believers, eternal life in heaven with Jesus is the prize. Eternal life in heaven with Jesus is the prize. Think more about heaven. 
Think more about Christ than you do the past. Surrender that bitterness to the Lord and ask him to conform you to the image of Christ. The greatest goal of every believer should be to be energetically or to energetically please the one who loved us and gave himself for us. If I have a goal for 2019, it should be to energetically please the Lord. And I put that word energetically in there because we can't coast through the Christian life and make progress. Paul said in verse 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He didn't say, I'm coasting through life. There's going to be an end. Praise God. The end's coming. Come, Lord Jesus. Be quick. Maybe even today. Get me out of this mess. He didn't say that. He said, as long as God gives me breath, I am pressing on. The word or phrase press on means to pursue to a goal, to press toward a goal, to strive energetically for some purpose. Let's put it this way. Uh, you're training your children to be responsible Christian adults. So you give them this overwhelming task that's going to stretch them. You ask them to take the garbage out. Right? It, it's, it's like you just ask them to cut off an arm. Would you rather have them grumble about that? Why do I always have to take the garbage out? Why can't somebody else take the garbage out? Why doesn't dad take the garbage out? The way kids operate today, I don't doubt that that gets said. Why can't dad do it? He never takes the garbage out. Or would you rather have a child that says, you know, my parents have provided so much for me, the least I can do is take the garbage out. I'd be honored to take the garbage out for you. You can wake up from your, from your fantasy now. Um, but wouldn't you love that? Just once. So, so kids, if you want to start a new year and give your parents a heart attack, be enthusiastic about the chore that they give you first thing in the new year. Well, you don't even have to wait till then. You got a couple of days. Practice now. But wouldn't you, rather, wouldn't you rather have the enthusiasm rather than the grumbling, I'm going to do it because you told me to do it, and I know that the beating is worse than doing it. Got quiet. You don't beat your kids, really. Not physically, but you beat them in your heart, I'm sure. Paul said he presses on enthusiastically. I press on for the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 3.1 says, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. We share in a heavenly calling. Getting through 2018 or getting through 2019 is not our goal. Our goal is to please the Lord who bought us because we're going to share heaven with him eternally. 1 Peter 5.10 says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, and strengthen and establish you. You're going to suffer. Sometimes we want to redo and we think that somehow magically when the calendar turns January 1, life starts over. January 1 is just the next day. There's nothing magical about January 1. People, I mean, there's fireworks and people are shouting and people are having parties. It's another day. And January 2, you go back to work. <laughs> and you find out very quickly it's just another day. Not much changes because it's 2019. Same old, same old. But you can change. And you can change not because you made a resolution that you're going to quit in a couple weeks, but because 
you're pointing your face toward heaven. You're not rehearsing the past. You're seeking to put on Christ and to live for him. The mark of Christian maturity is not perfection, but thinking and acting in accordance with what pleases Christ. That's the mark of Christian maturity. It's not perfection. It's thinking and acting in ways that please the Lord. So Philippians 3.15, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Uh, Paul has got this wonderful, I find it very appealing, sarcasm. He says, look, if you don't agree with me, in time God will show you you were wrong. Uh, look, the scriptures are right. In time, as you're growing in Christ, you'll align your heart because of the word of God with the scriptures. Don't follow a person follow Christ. Don't follow some charismatic, and I don't mean that in a Pentecostal way, but some charismatic, uh, uh, enthusiastic preacher who grabs your attention. He's a man. Follow Christ. And the more you ask God to align your heart with Christ, the more in line with Scripture your life becomes. So there are two classes of people in all of humanity those in Christ, and those not yet in Christ. What are you placing your hope in? Are you placing your hope in something, hoping that you've done the right thing or the right thing was done to you so that you can get eternal life from this thing or this event? Or... Are you placing your hope in Christ, faith in Christ, and him alone for salvation? If you're in Christ, grow. If you're not in Christ, yield to him. Confess you're not as smart as God and receive Christ as Savior. Would you stand with me? We'll pray. <clears throat> Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that the Apostle Paul so clearly tells us that we are not to put our trust in the things of this world. Whether it's the achievements that we've made or the things that have been taken from us that we wish we could get back. Help us to remember that Jesus Christ has given us something that will never be taken away. And we are preserved in Christ through faith in him to the very end. May we press on toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus and help us to not rehearse either our achievements or those things that have caused us pain, but help us to rehearse Christ, his great glory, his great grace, and may you, Father, be honored to change our hearts, keeping us focused on the eternal prize of being with Jesus. As we look forward to entering a new year, we ask you to renew our hearts. And we'll give you the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.